Two energy cost units, otherwise known as two drops, are a bit of a special one in Riftbound. Since the first player starts with two runes exactly, they're the only type of unit you can play on the very first turn of the game. That means they are likely to be the first one to score a point via conquering, and in some cases, even increase that point score further by holding the turn after. As would be expected from this absolutely beautiful start from Master Yi, playing a stalwart Poro turn 1 and conquering with it turn 2. By extension, if you have the good fortune of going first and your opening hand doesn't include any of these units, it's like a punch to the gut. You immediately lose any first player advantage you might have had, and since your opponent's consolation prize for going second is an additional rune, you'll find yourself at a disadvantage instead. In this video, I'm going to explore the maths of how your deck building choices influence the chances of seeing a 2-drop in your opening hand, exceptions to those rules, and finally we'll take a look at a couple pro player decks to see how they approach this area of the game. I'm Simon from Games Deconstructed, and let's get started. To find out the chances of seeing a specific card, or in our case a set of cards in our opening hand, we'll make use of a simple concept with a somewhat complicated name. Hypergeometric probability. Now, if I was the king of statistics, I would much rather call it a bunch of small probabilities, because that's what it is. Let's take my Annie deck as an example. It runs nine two-drop creatures. Our criterion for success is for me to draw at least one of them. So as I draw my first card, we calculate the first of those small probabilities. Nine cards out of 39 in my deck are hits, 30 out of 39 are misses. If I draw the two drop, we've obviously succeeded. I don't really care what I draw after because we already have at least one. However, if I don't, there's still nine of them left in the deck somewhere, but since I've drawn a card already, there's 38 cards left in that deck, not 39. So for the next card we draw, our probability of drawing a two cost is nine out of 38. If we still don't succeed, it becomes nine out of 37 and so on and so forth. Once initial draw is four cards, so my chances of seeing a two drop if I'm running nine of them is calculated as follows and results in a 66.7% chance. But of course that initial four is followed by a mulligan and then a draw at the beginning of my first turn. And yes, you also get it when you're going first, remember that. Let's assume I haven't drawn any two drops in my opening four. If I were to really fish for them, I could mulligan two cards by putting them on the bottom of my deck. I would then redraw the same number of cards. But take note, even though my deck is technically back to 35 cards after I put two on the bottom, I'm not going to draw the ones I've put at the bottom. So despite the deck's actual physical size, I'm looking for my nine hits in the top 33. If I go through this sequence, my chances of seeing at least one two drop in the five cards I've drawn and seven cards I've seen is going to be 86.8%. We would come up with the same number via just calculating seven card draws from that deck, since the calculation is just checking the rate of appearance in all the cards you see. It doesn't matter if you keep them or put them on the bottom of the deck, as long as you don't have a chance of drawing them again, it's all good. Now, I've done those calculations by hand, but for your benefit, if you ever find yourself in need of one, just Google Hypergeometric Calculator and let the software do their work for you. Now, here's how the probabilities change for decks that play more or less two costs than my nine. As you can see, the percentage drops to 72.2% when you play just six of them and rises to 94.2% when you go up to 12. Out of context, most of these percentages might seem okay, they are all above 50%, so that might be good, right? But remember, if you're a deck that cares about that early game tempo, missing that first turn draw, breaking that first turn is going to be a major blow to the effectiveness of your strategy. Let's go for a practical example here. Say you're playing a small event, four rounds of best of three, 2.5 games per match on average, so that's 10 games you'll get to play at that event. You're going first in five of these, so with six two drops and a 27.8% chance of breaking, the inverse of the chance of getting a two drop, 
in the games that you go first, you can expect 1.39 bad turn ones. Turn ones where you don't draw any two drops. If you're running 10 two costs, which gives you a 10.1% break chance, your expected number of games with that atrocious start falls down to 0.505 per event. So half a game versus 1.5 of a game. And that doesn't even take into account games where it's gonna be bad for you to not see a 2-drop going second, which might very well happen depending on how many 3-drops you play. Now, this might leave the impression that it's always better to include more 2-drops, but we have to keep in mind that it's bad to top deck those in the late game, and the chance of that happening is going to increase the more of them you put in your deck. Now, by how much exactly is going to be impossible for me to calculate, because it depends heavily on how many of them you draw in the early game, uh, how many cards you draw overall, your sources of card selection, how many you recycle, and all that good stuff. But what we can calculate is another unhappy scenario. The chances of seeing three or four of them in your opening hand. Because depending on the deck you play, your ideal hand probably includes at least one to drop, Two might be very decent in certain matchups, but three, or especially four, might be a bit too many. And running the numbers for this is a bit more complex, but let's say we always mulligan two cards from our opening hand. I know, not always true, but let's say we do. Mulligan away excess two drops if we already have two, and mulligan away any non-two-cost cards if we have two of those early game creatures or less. Here's our chances of getting a hand with three plus of them in that scenario, depending on how many we include in our deck. So from that perspective, we want to play enough two drops to ensure the consistency of drawing them early game, but not too many, so we don't dilute our deck for the late game. And that was the maths part. But unfortunately for me, we are not playing statistics the game, we are playing Riftbound. So there is a couple game mechanics specific exceptions to those rules that I would like to go over. But before we get into those, consider clicking that subscribe button if you're enjoying the video thus far. Thank you very much. Okay, so first of all, none of the above applies if your deck doesn't care about fighting for the board in the early game. For Aurora decks, not drawing any two drops on the first turn is a given because they play zero of them. <laughs> And I mean, sure, they would like to draw their first turn mobilizes if it's going to allow them to push Aurora out the door a turn earlier, but if they miss those, it's not the end of the world for them. Secondly, there's certain decks that have an ability in the Chosen Champion slash Legend zone that allows them to alleviate some of those consequences of missing their first turn draw. For example, Victor can just make a boy turn one. And sure, it's a bit weaker than most two drops, but it has the same capacity for conquering an empty battlefield on the next turn as any other two-drop unit would. For another example, Timo Scout, played from the Champion Zone, might not be the most exciting way to play the card, but he does give you that bit of added insurance in case you miss your two-drop. So that's going to allow you to be a little bit more liberal with playing low numbers of those early game units. Staying on the topic of consolation prizes, if you're able to do something else with that initial first turn 2 energy budget, let's say you're able to play a stacked deck, or you're Kai'Sa going against Ani and you're able to hexdecray the sneaky deck hunt that they play on their first turn, your energy is not going to waste. Sure, that's not going to give you that early game tempo advantage and that early game point score advantage that we've talked about, but it's better than nothing. Last scenario, starting from a different number of runes, is also going to have an impact. If there's an obelisk of power in play, or if you're going second and starting off of three runes that way, your pool of potential successes that you'd like to see in your opening hand will also include three drops. So that might help you ensure some more consistency, depending on how many three drops you play. Now, of course, the obelisk of power is only going to apply to at most two games per match, and that's if both you and your opponent are playing the location. And the going second part is only going to apply if you're a deck that wants to go second out of your own volition, and there's not too many of them in the current meta, or if the opponent chooses for themselves to go first, so for you to go second. Now, let's see how pro players approach this area of deck building. I've taken the liberty of picking up the top 16 deck lists from the Pro Play 10k in Orlando, a recent big tournament. 
If you'd like to explore these deck lists yourself, head to riftdecks.com, cause that's where I got them from. Out of the 16, we have 5 MF Aurora lists that play 0 2 cost units. Like we discussed earlier, they don't really care about the board in those first couple of turns, so open and shut case here. These are followed by 2 Aurora Yi lists. And these are a bit more interesting, cause the current flavor of the deck is that they actually play 6 2 drops in the sideboard. And you can replace Aurora and certain other cards with them in certain matchups. In these matchups, you could treat the Yees as a normal deck running 6 2 drops. But despite what we've previously said about the low reliability of just running 6 of them, the deck does have a bit more options. Since it still plays the Aurora top end units, ramping turn 1 instead of playing a unit is also at least somewhat acceptable. And the 3 mobilizers bring the count of acceptable turn 1 hits to 9. Since the deck also runs Obelisk of Power, in the game where that's played, Find Your Center also becomes an alright turn 1 option, giving you 12. Finally, setting up a Zonia turn 1 is also not the worst thing in the world in both the Aurora and mid-range mode of the deck. So despite nominally having 0 or 6 2-drop units, the deck has a wider pool of cards that are an acceptable play on turn 1. Ani decks in the top 16 play 9, with Tyler Mock as the exception running 10. Not much to say about this, it's an aggressive deck, so the slightly higher number of early game creatures makes sense. Having the Vi as your first turn play would obviously be a bit less exciting than having any one of the Merchants or Poros, but it is still an option. Colin Kaiser's set runs 7 in the main board plus 2 Poros in the side, the Kaisas run 9, with the exception of George Gebhardt's Kaisa, who cut 2 students for a total of 7 2 costs. Let me know in the comments what your favorite 2 cost unit in all of Riftbound is, and I hope you enjoyed the video! Huge thanks go to the Patreon supporters over on patreon.com slash gamesdeconstructed who got to read the script for this video a couple days early. Especially so to Jakub Burdun, Anna Schulz, and good luck. I've been Simon from Games Deconstructed, and I hope to see you in the next one.